Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening on UK Stocks, the Land of Dividends and Value. I'm Crystal, the Community Manager at Prosperous. Let me introduce our speakers for tonight. We have Tim, Head of Content and Investment Lead at Prosperous, with over 10 years of content experience in the financial industry, including stints at Schroders and the Motley Fool. Tim believes that successful long-term investing is within everyone's reach. Next up, we have Chin, our guest speaker for tonight, co-founder of The Smart Investor. Prior to that, he was one of the co-advisor on the Motley Fool's premium portfolio management service, Supernova, working alongside Motley Fool co-founder, David Gartner. Chin was also a key analyst at the Motley Fool Singapore that created six market-beating stock picking services. He has, he has been an investor for over 15 years and has 15 stocks that he has held for more than 10 years, including the likes of Parkway Life Week, Netflix, Amazon, Alphabet, and Apple. Prosperous is a digital investment service catered for the millennials. We aim to provide you with the best in-class service and to allow millennials to gain more insights on investing. We have specially curated webinar series. So with Prosperous, you will not only learn how to invest, but also enjoy curated lifestyle experiences at the same time. Check out our Prosperous app on Google Play and App Store today. Follow us on our social media to keep yourselves updated on the latest news. So without further ado, le let me hand over the time to Tim. Tim, over to you. Hi, Crystal. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, glad to have Chin with us tonight, who will uh, provide his insights after I go through my quick deck. So I'm just going to start uh, straight off um, and share my, uh, share my deck with you. And then once I go, Chin will go, and then we can do questions. But if you do have any questions, please just put them into the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end of the session. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with um, a look at the UK market. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, everything we say here is really not to be meant to be construed as personalized financial advice. So please do, do your own drill, due diligence as my compliance would like to say, and, you know, obviously research everything before you uh, make any investment decisions. Okay. So what's the UK stock market actually like? Um, we don't really have much of an impression of the UK. We kind of, uh, you know, see it as, you know, a great place to go. Europe is really lovely to go on holiday. Maybe it's not so great to invest in, uh, you know, European stocks or the UK stocks. Um, but the UK stock market is a bit different to Europe. And so I'm going to kind of outline a few, uh, few of those key differences and understand why uh, I think it deserves a bit of investors' attention and maybe a bit of uh, an allocation for, uh, for long-term investors as well. Okay, so let's start off with London. We all know London is really a global financial powerhouse. Um, you know, in the run-up to the, there was the big bang reforms in the 1980s in the city, which is which is where the square mile is, which is known as um, uh, you know you know where a lot of the big banks are in in this in uh, in the city in London, um, and it's got a really storied history. You know the London Metal Exchange has been there trading commodities uh, is, is is an exchange for over 150 years or nearly 150 years. Um, London's also the world's largest FX trading hub, so it gets to around three trillion uh, daily in FX trading volume. So it's absolutely massive. Uh, it's also home to the fifth largest stock market in terms of the country. So if you think of the U.S. as number one, home to Nasdaq and NYSE, and then you have China and Hong Kong with Shenzhen, Shanghai, Hong Kong. Uh, then you have Tokyo with Japan, and then uh, the London Stock Exchange is number five in terms of in terms of uh, the size for the, for the actual country. So the UK is actually fifth in terms of in terms of the stock market size. It's around 3.5, 3.6 trillion, I think, U US dollars. Uh, so it's a big market. Uh, it's significantly bigger than a lot of European markets and some Asian markets as well. And consistently ranks second, right, in the global financial rankings. So London's really a it's really a global financial uh, superpower. So it's something that we should keep in mind if we do invest in the, in the UK. So let's look at the FTSE 100. The FTSE 100 is really the key index. It's sort of the UK equivalent of the S&P 500. Um, you could think about it as more of an international index. A lot of it 
Its weighting is actually towards banks, uh, oil and gas. Uh, it's been described as a 20th century index or 19th century index, <laughs> no, not flatteringly so by, um, by you know, Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust's uh, ex-head James Anderson. But this is actually, I guess in these times, maybe that's something that we should, we should be valuing. So it has a lot of names that haven't done great, I guess, over the past decade and a half, but it's starting to turn now. So you're seeing Shell up there, uh, AstraZeneca, which is a defensive stock as well. It's in, it's in the pharma industry, HSBC, um, Unilever, Diageo. So these are names that everyone is familiar with. We all know. Um, they're profitable businesses. They all generate cash flows, you know, in the here and now. So these are these are defensive names, and I think this is something that the investment community is starting to wake up to in, in these times, in uh, the volatile times that we're going through right now. Um, and so dividends really power this index, right? So dividends, if you think about reinvestment of dividends, there's always that those charts that you'll see where dividends make up a third of. Uh, total return, you know, over a certain period of time, whereas in the FTSE 100 dividends really make up a massive, massive chunk of that total return. So even though over the past 30 years, it's only generated about 400% uh, return, and even over the past decade, I don't think it's even done maybe 150, 200%. It's, it's definitely far out underperformed the S&P 500 over the past decade. Um, but what it hasn't, you know, sort of made up in the price return, there's definitely been more of a total return with the dividends that have been paid out. Obviously, that took a dip with the COVID-19 pandemic, but I think now that we're seeing a return to some sort of normalcy, um, you know, and, and the defensive qualities of a lot of these names, that's starting to come through now. Uh, so our impression of UK companies is, you know, we think they're old school, they're not really relevant, they're going to be disrupted. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of companies globally have to deal with but in the UK because of the index's makeup it's something that is constantly thrown at uh, is constantly thrown at names in the UK or big companies in the UK but I think the reality is a bit more nuanced than that right so I think we should explore what's the big deal about the UK market and why should we actually think about it uh, as as an as an investment destination for our for our money okay so let's go through why we should think about investing in the UK um, it's always had, as I said, it's always had a story history of being a big dividend payer. Um, you can kind of see this is a snapshot from Global Dividend Index, which is a, an index that Janice Henderson runs every year or every quarter, actually. Uh, this is the annual report from uh, 2021. Um, so you saw Royal Dutch Shell, they've been a massive, uh, a massive payer of dividends. These are, uh, let me just give you a bit of context. These are companies that pay out the biggest dollar amount of dividends. So it's not high yielding or whatever, it's the biggest dollar amount. So tech has started to come into it more and pay more. Obviously you're seeing the likes of Microsoft and Apple pay a lot of dividends in terms of dollar amounts just because they're so big. Um, but then 2021, you're seeing a lot of the metal and mining names, BHP Group, Rio Tinto, which is also listed in the UK. These two, two names are dual listed with, with Australia, but they're also listed in London. Um, you know, they're starting to pay out more and more dividends as cash flows come through. Um, and oil companies like Royal Dutch Shell, they've had a really bad run of things for the past decade, but a lot of people are now looking at their cash flows as being more con uh, consistent because CAPEX for a lot of these names have come down significantly, right, while the oil prices jumped. So I think, for example, I think in around 2012, 13, Shell was spending around nearly 40 billion a year on CAPEX um, as of you know, its latest quarter, it was spending an annual run, annual, uh, run rate of around sort of 20 billion. So it cut its CAPEX in half basically over the past, uh, over the past sort of six, seven, eight years. Um, so that's allowing a lot more free cash flow to flow to, uh, to, the, to shareholders as well. So I think in the years to come, if, you know, things stay stable, these are the kinds of names they're trying to shift towards renewable energy. A lot of the European names like Shell versus, say, Exxon or Chevron, they're doing a lot more on the renewable energy side. They're trying to transition away from the reliance on oil and gas and fossil fuels. And obviously, I think they'll be part of that solution rather than, um, you know, companies that we shun as, as investments. So I think it's something that we need to think about as, as investors, whether you want to be invested in them, I think is, you know, a personal decision. Um, but they will have a lot more cash flow, I think, in the years to come. Uh, something we probably don't know is that the UK actually doesn't have a dividend tax. So there's a zero dividend withholding tax. So whatever gets paid out to international investors or investors actually in the UK, you won't be taxed on it. So it's great. You get to keep all of your money. Unlike in the US where it's a 30% tax, which I know a lot of people have issues with. 
Um, so that's something that I think we should we should value as uh, as investors. So this is just a little snapshot. If you use the QR code, you can go take a look at an uh, interesting table of global dividend withholding tax rates globally. Um, UK is not, I guess, uh, unique. You know, Singapore is zero percent, Hong Kong is zero percent, but I think UK is unique in that it's one of the only big, big, big markets that is zero percent. You know, you have smaller ones like uh, you'll see right here, UAE and uh, Vietnam, but those types of things are they're a bit more. Um, the liquidity in these markets is obviously very low and you don't really know much about the companies and so et cetera, et cetera. There's not really an opportunity to invest for the average investor. Um, so for the UK, you can get access to some really great companies um, at you know a 0% rate if they do pay dividends. And obviously the UK is a massive dividend, uh, is a massive dividend hub. So it's something to, uh, to I guess, value, as, as I said, it's, it's something that we should definitely be happy about as investors. We don't get taxed. I mean, less tax is always good, right? Um, as I said, commodities driving dividends post-pandemic. So uh, this is a headline recently from Bloomberg. Uh, first quarter dividends are rising. Um, obviously, I think this is something that we have to weigh up against what happened during the pandemic. There was a massive crash in demand. And so dividend payouts did suffer in the UK, but then they bounced up quite quickly. So if you're thinking about there being a time for commodities to come back, so the past decade and a half since the end of the China boom and sort of the end of 2009-10, uh, commodities have been basically in the doldrums, right? But if you think commodities are set for a good run or commodities in general are going to stay high because of inflation, et cetera, then I think this provides a good hedge for your portfolio in terms of um, you know, if you have your growth and you have obviously your, all your innovative companies and then you have your dividends, your commodities, uh, you know, your value companies, I think the UK can be really seen as that hedge to the more growthy part of a, of a portfolio. So something to, uh, to consider as well. Okay, so I'm going to just go do two quick examples of dividend companies in the UK. Um, there are two that I, I quite like and I think that, you know, they're one is very well known, one's maybe less well known, but it's still it's still a dividend pair. So I'll just run through these quite quickly. Um, okay, so Unilever, we all know, is just a massive consumer staples giant. It owns actually over 400 brands. Um, 13 of those do over a billion euros in, uh, in revenue, annual revenue. So it's a huge, uh, basically a huge conglomerate of, of brands. It's sort of the UK equivalent of Procter & Gamble, right? Procter & Gamble is listed in New York. And you have Unilever that's listed in London, it's headquartered in the UK. It used to be dual headquarters. It used to be headquartered in Amsterdam, and they were thinking about where they were going to headquarter uh, permanent headquarters. And now it's in London. But there is a Amsterdam listing, and there is also, I think, a, you know, obviously an ADR for um, for uh, for Unilever as well. But it's really its home, and and it's it's sort of um, where it's really based, and its history is 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 in the UK. So it's a it's a massive massive. Uh, growth opportunity for uh, for investors or I think it's more of a stable sorry a stable giant but it's got growth because a lot of the growth is coming from EMs as, a, as you can kind of see here so PNG is a bit more established in developed markets whereas Unilever is a bit more geared towards emerging markets and demand for consumer staples in those markets so you can kind of see the growth that they've had even throughout the past sort of three four years in uh, in markets such as India and China, as well as the US, they also have a, obviously a pretty big presence in the US as well. Uh, and so last quarter, this first quarter of this year, they actually recorded growth across all the regions um, that they that they trade in. Uh, and so, you know, Asia is a big part of, a big focus of theirs as well as Europe. So um, Unilever itself is a very, very solid company. It's one of those reliable dividend payers. It's something that, everyone uses, right? We all use detergent, we all use shampoo. It's stuff that we all, um, we all you know, use on a daily basis. So these kinds of consumer staples companies now are receiving a lot more love that from investors than they have done previously. Uh, Valuation-wise, it's a little bit different. Obviously, it's a bit expensive at this time. Um, but if you're someone who wants to still receive a yield uh, and you think this is a place that you can part your money, then this is something that you know, a lot of investors are, are gravitating towards. Um, and so a steady dividend pair, you know, near 4% yield, they've managed to grow their underlying profit, underlying uh, revenue growth uh, in the latest quarter. Um, and they've managed to uh, raise prices as well successfully, right? So that's showing that they have pricing power. So a company of this scale and size 
uh, with the amount of brands that they have, they definitely have pricing power. That's something to, uh, to, um, to consider as well when we look at the UK. Okay, so my second company is called Greg's. So this is something that maybe not everyone's familiar with, but if you ever spent time in the UK or if you, you know, went to university there or whatever, there's a lot of pastries in the UK. And so they started out as really a, a typical bakery. And so if you have like Cornish pasties, you know, you have your cheap Cornish pasties, your cheap sort of bacon rolls, your sausage rolls, your baps. Uh, and it's a really, really cheap and but also delicious place to just grab something on the go that's quick. Um, and they've done really, really well over the past decade. So they've actually transformed themselves over the past decade. If you look at their share price return, if you look at their revenue growth, their revenue growth is actually not that exciting. They've less than doubled sales, I think, in the past 10 years, but their EPS is about tripled, right? So they've been doing things right. They've been managing to get um, like uh, better margins, uh, sort of driving new, new initiatives and new channels. And so they're investing for growth, right? So they do have an ambitious target uh, coming out of the pandemic to grow even more, uh, to double turnover in, in within five years. Um, and they have lots of opportunities to do this. So this is much more a play, I think, on the local market, the local consumer market uh, to consumer discretionary, but it's more geared towards the lower end of the market. So it's something that I think a lot of uh, a lot of people, even if they're going to cut back on food or discretionary spend, this is something that a lot of people could easily afford to, you know, to grab on the go in the mornings or at lunchtime. So that's something that um, that should allow us to sleep a bit easier at night, I think, with uh, with the recession that looks likely uh, on the horizon. But if you think about the um, the locations of Greg's stores, they're actually have uh, about 10 percent of franchise, but they own and run a lot of their own shops. Um, and if you think about the locations in the UK market of where they're placed, either in retail parks or in underground stations, or even in uh, inside supermarkets, there's a massive growth runway for them to expand into these spaces a lot more. So on the left, on the current shops trading, that's where they are currently. And on the right is you know what they've considered the locations in the UK market where there's potentially their total addressable market to expand into, right? So that's something that they have a lot of uh, a lot of focus on, and I think they're they're expanding at a at a good clip in, in different areas of the market. And so this is a company that's sort of transforms with the consumer. Uh, I like to think of it and look at it as more of like the UK version of like a Chipotle, which I think, you know, Jen will, Jen will attest to is a great company. Um, and it's really been quite innovative at how it looks at expanding its growth. Uh, and it's not an exciting, super exciting market, just like, you know, food preparation or a Chipotle or Starbucks isn't super exciting, but it's innovative in the way that they go about trying to deliver that good to people. So with Greg's, they're looking, you know, at drive throughs for further expansion. They want on the go shops. They're investing into Capex to make their shops, um, you know, more uh, inviting for people to come in. Digital capabilities in food prep. Uh, they're targeting net annual shop openings of 150 over the next uh, next few years. And, you know, this is a company that I think really, um, is been growing its uh, dividend as well. So it has a dividend kick out around 12% over the past decade. Um, and they're starting to move also into the night market. So if you think about food that's delivered uh, on your app, a lot of orders or a lot of uh, people that order food on apps, they actually do it at night. So over 40% of orders in the UK come at night, right after the 4 p.m. market. So it's the sort of the night market. And so Greg's is starting to transition away from just being breakfast and lunch food towards moving towards more night market type, night night foods as well. So they're doing sort of takeaway pizzas, slices, they're doing takeaway pastries as well that are geared towards the, the crowd that are maybe coming back at night and want something to eat and something to, to grab on the go. So I think this is a company that's really been quite flexible and agile in the way that it's uh, adapted to the consumer in the UK. Um, and as I said, it's grown its dividend really strongly over the past decade. It did have to suspend it during the pandemic because everything basically closed down. Um, but it did re renew its uh, resume its dividend in 2021 uh, after 2020 uh, sort of went by. So it's something that I think you know we all should uh, should study closer. Just take a look at it. It's a really interesting company. It's been on my watch list for a long time. I'm a big admirer of the, uh, the management of the of the strategy. Um, I don't own it at the moment, but it's something I've always, I've always been uh, very intrigued by. So, um, yeah, so I think 
that's it for me. I'm just going to wrap up really quickly. So why UK stocks? Uh, check out the article I've written on the London Stock Exchange. It's just a quick cheat sheet for investors just to understand this London Stock Exchange. What are the main, uh, what are the main criteria for it? What do you need to do when you buy stocks? Um, how do you understand you know, how, to, how to go about uh, placing orders or you know, uh, understanding the market? Um, and the, on the left, there's a, you know, a quick uh, recap of everything. So there's no dividend tax. There's a lot of dividend stocks. There's a, definitely a tilt towards the value end of the market, which I think people are starting to appreciate now after basically being hated on for about a decade. Um, it has global revenues. So the FTSE 100 is essentially quite global. So even if the dollar remains strong, a lot of those um, revenues that get, get repatriated back into, into British pounds uh, earnings aren't going to be, maybe they'll be materially better than they might have otherwise been if they were in the local currency. Uh, and then with ETFs, you can actually also buy ETFs that track the US market that have a better withholding tax. So that's also a benefit that maybe not everyone's aware of. So if you buy ETFs that track maybe the S&P 500 that are listed in London, um, they'll be island domiciled and you'll be taxed 15% instead of 30% on your dividends. So that's always uh, that's something to, uh, to be a fan of as well. Um, okay, so I'll finish there. I won't take up any more of your time and I'll pass on to Chin. So Chin, please, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Okay. So I'm going to be candid. Uh, when Tim asked me to do a presentation and, and attend this webinar on UK stocks, uh, my first reaction is, I don't know anything about UK stocks. Sure, I've studied some of them, a handful of them, but I, I'm so far away from the expert, right? But I, I think that's a good thing because uh, this is an introductory lesson or, or a session. And I feel like I can be, I, I can be in the shoes of an of the Singaporean investor looking at all these stocks from a foreign land and wondering why I should be spending time on that, right? So I'd like to share some of my thoughts on how I look at uh, dividend stocks, which are not located in Singapore and how I think about it. So when it comes to dividends, right? Um, I always think that dividend stocks have one job, right? You have one job and it's in the name to pay dividends. So it really, for me, it starts with, can that company pay a dividend, right? This is always the first question my co-founder, David Kuo, would ask, uh, does that company pay a dividend? That's the, like the criteria for him to, before he consider any company. But dividends have to come from somewhere, right? It doesn't appear out of nowhere. And that's where you have to look whether or not there's cash to actually pay this dividend, right? If there's no cash, or if the company is taking on debt to pay a dividend, then you'll know that that dividend is going to run out soon. So you need that amount of cash on, on the, in, in the company for, in order for it to be able to pay a dividend. And of course, the cash also does not appear out of nowhere. You need a strong business that is in turn able to generate cash and in turn be able to pay you, the investor, a dividend, right? And more, more than ever, it's not just about a one-time payment. You want all this to be sustainable as well, right? So I want to go through each segment because for me, this is sort of a very simple mental model that I can apply to, especially today where things are quite noisy. There's so much news in the air about inflation, about China, about the Russian and Ukraine war. And this model really helps me ground uh, everything when I, I look at a business. So I'll start with the business itself. Um, one thing, when, when, if I'm a Singaporean looking at UK companies, they're located overseas and so on, then I wouldn't want to look for something which is different from what I can get in Singapore, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, in Singapore, I feel that we have pretty good banks. They pay a really nice dividend. They are, I think, uh, pretty well run. They have very low cost cost efficiency ratios. So this becomes a hurdle for me, right? DBS becomes like a hurdle for me when I compare it with other banks. Uh, do, do they have U, UK banks which are better than DBS? If it's just the same or not better, then I'd rather just stay at home, right? So I want something which is different and better. 
But different does not mean it has to be unfamiliar. There are many brands which I, I think we are familiar with, even though they're different from what, what is listed in the Singapore stock market, right? So think about uh, the last time you walked into a Guardian, right? You wouldn't look for, for, or for uh, aspirin. Or you wouldn't look for paracetamol. You'll ask for Panadol, right? And Panadol is by GSK, a UK listed company. Think about uh, antiseptic. If you want to, you have cut, you, you want to clean that wound, you won't ask for antiseptic. You ask for Dettol, right? And Dettol is a brand which is by uh, Racket Ben Kaiser, also another company listed in the UK. So my point here is that they, I think we are blessed to be in Singapore because we are, there are so much global brands that are close to us that uh, I, would, I would really challenge the fact that uh, I think some of these brands, we know them better than our Singapore brands, right? I mean, how, how many of you know how to tell the difference between a Capel oil rig and a Samcorp marine oil rig? I know I can't, but uh, I, I know Dettol is a really... A strong household name, right? So I, I would venture that I know that all better than a capital, right? Even though it's listed overseas. So things can be familiar to us, even though the company is not listed in Singapore. Which brings me to the next point. Um, do these companies generate cash? And for me, the main measure is really free cash flow. Um, to, to give a very quick rundown of what free cash flow is, you start with operating cash flow. And this is money which the existing operations of the company uh, that generates. And um, this money is not profits because you can book profits, but you haven't received the money. This is actual cash, which the company receives, right? Or, or generates out of its existing business. And from it, you have to take out what you call capital expenditure. And these are things which you reinvest into the business. So recently my wife tried to get uh, grilled fish saba for me from a Japanese restaurant, but they, their grilled machine was uh, actually spoiled. So they couldn't sell that dish at all. And, and that is part of uh, Capex investment, right? If you don't have that equipment, you won't be able to sell some of your dishes. And that's a problem because if you can't um, sell some of your dishes, you can't generate revenue from those dishes. So there's this reinvestment into the business which is needed to either maintain it or to grow it. And what's left after that? So when you, when you have all this cash generated from your, your existing operations, you take out the operating uh, expenditure or the capital expenditure, what you're left with is free cash flow. And the name free uh, implies that they are free to use it in a few ways. So free cash flow can be used to acquire other businesses. So to expand the uh, a restaurant chain can buy another restaurant chain to expand its business. They can use it to repay debt if they have any debt on their balance sheet. They can use it to buy back shares. And of course, the most important part for dividend investors, they can also use it to pay out dividends, right? And so you can see that there are many users for free cash flow. They can use it to expand their business, pay back debt, buy back shares, or pay out dividends. And for us as investors, what we really want is that last point, right? Pay out dividends. Because a company can generate cash, but unless it's a read where it's mandated to actually share that profits with you, it doesn't mean that that business is going to share those profits with you. And that's really important. So you need a company with a long track record of actually uh, paying out part of their free cash flow as dividends to you, right? So which brings me to the final point, dividends. You want a long track record for that company to actually pay regular dividends for you. So I wanted to share one example, which would sort of cover my last two points. Uh, this is a company called Rightmove. It's listed on the London Stock Exchange under RMV. And uh, you can think of it a bit like a, uh, a profitable uh, property guru, right? So I, I think you've heard or, or maybe even use the, the, the site Property Guru before. Uh, so Rightmove is sort of the UK version of Property Guru, but it is super, super profitable, right? Uh, if you look at how much gen revenue they generate, $1 of revenue uh, can be turned into a, an average of 56 cents. So more than 50% of it becomes free cash flow. So superly, 
super high profits, right? And you can see that um, until the pandemic struck, uh, if you follow the green line, this is the free cash flow generated per share by right move. And it's been steadily going up. They got hit by the pandemic like many other businesses, but you can see that has already recovered and in fact grown, grown their free cash flow per share uh, in 2021. And what's more important, the final point, do they share all these profits with you, right? And you can see there's a very steady increase. Uh, there's a drop in 2019 and 20 because they canceled the final dividend for 2019 in, in view of the pandemic. But you can see that now that the uh, dividends are creeping back up. And if I'm a shareholder, I'll, I'll start asking management, hey, you know, you can actually afford to pay more. Uh, why aren't you doing so? So this is just one example of a different company, uh, which can be familiar because it's, uh, if, if you looked at uh, Property Guru before, you can understand how that business works. And yet uh, it, it's able to generate free cash flow and pay out dividends. So I hope that that gives you some insight of how I think about when I, I approach a different market like the UK. And that is my presentation. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, my disclaimer at the end. Thanks, Chin and Tim for your presentation earlier. I think we have uh, quite a few questions coming from the audience today. Can we take a look at the first question? Okay. okay, so the first question is, uh, which UK stock screener would you recommend? Um, okay, I think like there are quite a few stock screeners that are very good for US, um, but the UK is a bit less, it's a bit less accessible, but there's one called tradingview.com uh, that is a good screener. I, mean, I, I personally don't use screeners that much to like screen things because I mean, like you can find out the interesting fundamentals, but you don't really understand the business or what's going on. So I feel like you really need to use it as, well, I would suggest using it as a supporting tool to understand the fundamentals, but you really need to understand the business as well. So don't just um, go into a stock screener and look for like the highest yielding names because that, that's, uh, that's probably not going to be that productive for you or your portfolio. <laughs> over the long term. So, um, but TradingView does have access to the UK market. So you can take a look there um, and play around with it. There's, you know, I think it also has uh, some quite good data for the US as well. So the US is, you know, obviously very accessible. Um, but yeah, tradingview.com, uh, go check that out for UK screeners if you're interested. Thanks, Tim. How about Chin? Do you have any recommendation on stock <laughs> so, um Like Tim, I, I, I don't really use uh, screeners. Um, I think that, but I have one thought now, because uh, if, if you look at the example I showed just now on right move, you can see why I don't use screeners, right? Because um, I think this will be quite common with the dividend stocks where you, you'll see companies experience this decline in debt, dividends paid or how their fundamentals get impacted by the last two years. And if you do not sort of like set your, your screening uh, criteria correctly, you might actually miss out on a really good uh, dividend payer such as uh, right move. Thanks, Chin. Let's take a look at the next question. I saw Grex is 2128. Does it mean a single share is at 2128 pound? And can we buy one stock each? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think this is something else that, uh, yeah, I, I should have maybe mentioned or clarified. So. Prices in the UK are quoted in P, so that's pence. Um, and so 100 pence is to, equal to one pound. So it's kind of like um, 100 Singapore cents equals a dollar, you know, it's to say. So, um, so the prices quoted on the London Stock Exchange are in pence. So that's 2,128 pence. So that would be, divide that by 100. So it's basically 21 pounds, uh, 28p. So that's um, how you look at stock prices um, in the UK. Basically divide them by a hundred uh, and you'll get the price in pounds. Yeah, that, that's, that's it. And you can, uh, the second part of the question, you can buy single stocks in the UK. Yeah, you can buy single stocks. You don't have to buy, they don't do lots in the UK. You don't have to buy uh, a certain amount. You can buy single stocks 
in the UK, yeah, single shares. Thanks, Tim. Um, let's move on to the next question. Commodity stocks like BHP and Real Tinto are listed in Australia and UK. Is it better to buy them on Australia exchange or UK exchange? Foreign exchange versus the tax? Um, I think it also depends on where it's domiciled. So you would need to research where the domicile is for uh, for either of them. If it's dual domicility or dual domicile, then maybe I think it, it, it could basically be dependent on where you hold the shares. I mean, for me, it would be a no brainer because I think Australia taxes are like 30% or 25% or something. So, um, and the foreign exchange to me is not that much of a big deal because over the past, I think two years, the Singapore dollar has strengthened against the pound. But then prior to that, the pound was, you know, at a, was at, at a high, uh, you know, so it all evens out. It's like quite volatile, but it's not something that will make a, it's not the kind of movements you see in crypto markets, right? So it's not going to completely destroy any value you get from your investment. Um, so I think you just have to accept that that's part of investing overseas. Yeah, uh, I just took a quick look at the exchange rate between the British pound and Singapore dollar. So I think it's been fairly, uh, call it stable since 2016. I think that's when they announced Brexit. Yeah. There was this uh, evaluation of the pound, but then it's mm. kept pretty stable after that. Yeah. Thanks, Tim and Chin. Let's uh, move on to the next question. The next question, please. Um, okay, maybe I'll just read out the next question. Um, investors looking for bigger capital gains may want to consider US stocks as UK stocks do not represent sizable upsides. Is that true or false? Um, yeah, I mean, the general consensus is that the US over the past decade has, um, but I don't think it's something that has to be is like you know mutually exclusive like you either have us stocks or you have uk stocks it's more a question of what does your overall portfolio look like and can you find stocks in the uk or can you find components of the uk market that fit uh i guess a purpose in your portfolio and which is maybe not so correlated to the us because at the end of the day, a lot of these assets are correlated. So stuff like everyone's talking about crypto not being correlated. And then now you're seeing crypto get smashed along with, with stocks, right? So that's complete. That's basically being completely upended. Um, but if you look at the UK FTSE 100 versus the S&P this year, at least this year, it's down, what, maybe like 3% or 2%. And the S&P, as we all know, is, you know, it's close to a bear market. It's down nearly 20%. So um, there are different companies, right? So if you're thinking about the past decade, for sure, it's been way better to be in the US, like no doubt. Um, but if you're thinking that the tide's turning and there's going to be an, a period of outperformance, then it's more hedging your, hedging your investments and thinking like, where do I want some exposure to? And, you know, is that going to even out some of the volatility from your US portfolio? Um, so for me, it's, well, the question of like, I just have to have 100% UK or 100% US, I think you need to tailor your portfolio to your own risk as well and, and what you see, because everyone's quite different how they view their risk and whether they want more dividends or whether they want more growth or whether they want more stability or they're quite happy to go through like 50, 60%, 70% drawdowns um, and hold and then continue to, to ride out the recovery. So everyone's very different. Um, so I think it depends on your own personal preference, but I don't think it's uh, either or. I think you can have both. You just need to balance it. Yeah, that, that's what I would say. 
I think it's slightly to US being the size of the market it is, and, and it just has uh, much more sort of options and, and much more variety in terms of uh, tech stocks, for example. But uh, I, I don't think that you, you can say that, you know, it's like, as Tim said, either or, right? There, there are UK companies which have done pretty well. It still has quite a sizable population, which you can build a, bus a huge business on, right? So I just took a quick look at Greg's, which... Uh, which was uh, the company which uh, Tim brought up. And uh, since since 1993, right, it's up 36 times, which is not too bad, right? <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> so it, it basically turned a dollar into almost uh, $36, basically, or more than $36. Thanks, Chin. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the next question. Are UK companies ADR traded in the US also tax free for dividends? Um, I don't think so. I'm not a tax expert, but I would assume they would probably be because they are domiciled in the UK. So um, I think they would be because it, I think it depends on the domicile of the company that you own. So um, I, I, I know that like TSMC, which I own, you, you know, that pays out, I think, on the Taiwan withholding rate, which I think is 20% or something. So that that was TSM that's listed in New York. Um, so if it's domiciled in the country, then it should uh, technically reflect that. But don't hold me to that because I don't have personal experience with that. So. <laughs> but I think it should. I think it should technically um, be that way. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Jin, do you have anything to add? <laughs> yeah, I'm not a tax expert, so uh, yeah. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. London. Uh, yes. What are some of the best ETFs for the London market? Um. Okay, I can take the this one. I um. I think if you're looking at a um, FTSE 100, uh, you can look at an iShares. I think they have, um, I think it's ISF or IFS, uh, which is a, it's basically a, the iShares, like BlackRock iShares core uh, FTSE 100 ETF, which tracks the FTSE um, 100. So it's pretty much, you know, does what it says on the tin. Um, I think Vanguard and BlackRock will also probably offer uh, FTSE 250s, which are, more geared towards the local economy, a bit more breadth in terms of the sector exposure, um, not as international, like FTSE 250 is not as international. So FTSE 100, you would probably consider like you know, international basket, big, large cap, and then FTSE 250 would be the, the sort of like mid cap as well, but less international and a bit more focused, more geared towards the local uh, British economy. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Mm. Chin, do you have any recommendations on that? Um, unfortunately, no. I'm, I'm quite new to the market. So I, I, yeah, no, sorry. No worries. Thanks, Chin. Let's take a look at the next question. Mm. Is currency risk with the GBP something to worry about given Brexit, inflation, etc.? Um, I think I answered this already kind of with what I said about fluctuations. Um, I don't think it's, there's always going to be something to worry about, you know, inflation in the US now, but then you're seeing the dollar be strong. So, um, and then, you know, the Aussie dollar is weak because I don't know, it's, it's, you know, there are so many issues with, with the economy and then I don't know. So I think if you're going to expose yourself to overseas stocks, that's just something you have to be comfortable with. But I think going overseas, I mean, having uh, Singapore is obviously this, the safety and the comfort of having everything in Singapore dollars. But if you want the opportunities, like Chin was saying in the US, just being big and then the UK also being a decently sized market, you, uh, you have to go overseas to really grow. Um, yeah, to, to get your upside over the long term. So I think that's something that is just part of uh, investing overseas. 
Yeah, I think that I remember going back to the great financial crisis of 2008. Uh, there was a point of time where a lot of people were questioning the US dollar and whether or not it's still a viable currency, right? And, you know, here we are, uh, 12 years later, or 14 years later, and US dollar is still uh, one of the most uh, favored uh, reserve currency of the world, right? So uh, I, I did also mention that the, there was some volatility in the British pound um, on after the Brexit uh, vote was done. And uh, since then, uh, I, I think that even after the, the Brexit has been confirmed and signed for, uh, it, it's still been pretty stable considering the fact that uh, the last two years was a pandemic, right? So I, I feel that um, as Tim said, it's, there's probably going to be going to be some ups and downs, but over time, it should just uh, even out. Thanks, Chen. I think we have a few more questions, right? Can we take a look at the next one? If there's three takeaways, why should I consider UK stocks? Would I be summing it up correctly? that they are first uh, on diversification. Next one is on potential upside in known value stocks cited tonight. And the last one, no withholding tax. Any other compelling reasons? Um, I think there's something which is maybe perhaps underappreciated um, with UK stocks is, I think it's much more of a market that is, I mean, it, the US type of investing. So they're much more, um, you know, they're much more geared towards, even though it's quite a, um, even though it's a democracy and it's quite uh, maybe what the US would consider socialist and not so much focused on capitalism, it's much more aligned in its way of thinking about business to the US than maybe Europe is. Uh, so I think Europe is a bit more a bit more of that state state led kind of growth and not as friendly maybe to shareholder capital whereas the US, UK is I think a bit more aligned with how you would think about business maybe in the US um, and there's not that's something you can never really maybe put tangible uh, value to but again it's a developed market it has the rule of law um, shareholder rights are respected so these are things that we don't really talk about that much maybe but maybe we should given you know what we're seeing in China recently with shareholder rights and you know the rule of law um, those types of things um, you know if you're investing into a developed market with the rule of law your money you know technically if you're with companies they'll be respected your shareholder rights will be respected so that's something that we don't really highlight that much in today's world, um, but that's something that you should think about as, you know, it's a developed market. It's been around for hundreds of years. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's got a history. It's, it's stable. Um, so I think that's something that is underappreciated. So, you know, I'd, I'd probably put that in again as a, as something to, um, as a reason to, to think about it. It's more of like a proxy for Europe. I think it's the best play in Europe, to be honest, by, by quite a way. Thanks, Tim. I, I think we have two more questions, but uh, I think uh, we have answered it in the Q&A function. Maybe let's just uh, flesh it out so that everyone can also uh, be aware of what the questions were and what we have answered. Okay, uh, so the first question was, which platform can we use to trade UK stocks and is the fee expensive? So basically, right, uh, you can actually check out Prosperous where you can actually trade UK stocks and we have one of the lowest commissions rates for uh, the London Stock Exchange from 0.08% to 0.1%. So you can check out more uh, with this link, uh, this one will be shared in the chat box later. And the next one, right, it's actually on um, how do we buy and sell UK companies from uh, London Stock Exchange and do we need to settle the trade in GPP? So uh, you can actually use the platform, the Prosperous platform to buy and sell UK stocks and trades are settled in uh, British pounds but you can actually fund your account in SGD. So the platform will actually do the auto conversion into pounds to settle the trades. Yeah, 
uh, I'll just uh, let this slide stay on for a little bit longer. And um, these are the last two questions that we have from uh, the audience. And uh, thank you, Tim and Chin, for tonight's session. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks and everyone. thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, you may reach out to us via email at uh, hello at prosperous.asia. And shortly after this, uh, yeah, okay. So this one is that uh, we will actually like a little help from you to know uh, more on how we can actually further improve our webinars moving forward. So do uh, scan the QR code shown in this slide to help us with the survey. And uh, if and we have actually shared this the link in the chat box as well. Thank you for tonight's session and thank you everyone for joining us tonight.